Hello, fellow travelers. I'm Nomad Jim, a retired, minimalist, solo, full-time slow traveler. Thanks for stopping by. One of the very positive and educational things about traveling to other countries is that it opens your eyes to the multitude of different ways that people do things. We make assumptions that the way we do things in our country is the way that they are done in other countries as well. But the more you travel, the more you realize that's not necessarily the case. So in today's video, what I want to do is address some of these common assumptions that I hear over and over again. And I'm gonna break them down into several different categories. I'm gonna do uh, restaurants, restrooms, money, transportation, electricity, and also just some common uh, terminology that's different in different places. So let's get started. So let's talk first about restaurants. Now, you may make the assumption that when you walk into a restaurant in some other country, it's gonna be very much the same type of experience as when you walk into it in your own country. So if you're an American, you may expect that when you sit down at your table, you're gonna have the same utensils there. You'll have a fork, a knife, and a spoon. But in other parts of the world, that's not necessarily the utensils that you'll have. Certain parts of Asia, you may have just chopsticks. Other parts, like in Southeast Asia, you may have just a fork and a spoon. There are no knives. Very unusual to find knives in Asia in general. And there may be some places, such as in India, where you eat with your hands. You don't even have utensils on the table. So these are all differences that you will see in different parts of the world. Another thing you may assume is that you'll get a glass of water when you sit down at your table. That's something that you see in the United States, but you really don't see that in other parts of the world. If you want water, you're going to have to ask for it, and you're going to have to pay for it as well. Also, they'll ask you whether you want still water, which is just regular bottled water, or you want sparkling water. Or they may ask you if you want it with gas or without gas. And then with respect to drinks also, is that you're not going to get ice in your drink. In the United States, that's a common thing with most drinks. You're going to get ice to make it colder. That's not something you see in most other parts of the world. You'll get a cool drink. It may have been refrigerated, but it's not going to have ice in it. And if you want it to be colder and have ice, you're going to have to ask for ice for your drink. It's not going to come automatically with the drink. One other assumption with restaurants is that you're going to get your bill without asking for it. Now, in the United States, that's a very common practice. They'll bring around the bill, put it on your table while you're still eating your meal. But that's not something you're going to see in other parts of the world. They're only going to bring you your bill when you ask for it. And you can sit there and enjoy your meal, enjoy your conversation as long as you like. They're not going to chase you out of the restaurant so they can get more customers in. That's the nice thing about restaurants in other countries. You have the time to relax, to enjoy your meal without feeling like they're rushing you out of the restaurant. Another restaurant assumption is that tipping is expected. Now, in the United States, it is expected. It's almost an obligation. And I understand the reason for that. The people who are the wait staff are not paid the full wage. So they have to make up what they're missing by getting tips. So we feel an obligation as customers to give 20, 25 percent even to help make up for that difference. But in the rest of the world, that's not an issue. Tipping can be done if you really like the service, if it's really exceptional, you can give a little bit of a tip. It's not going to be 20 or 25 percent. Usually the standard is between 5 and 10 percent. But there's no obligation to give a tip in other countries. A final assumption with restaurants that I hear from a lot of people is that there's this thought that if you go to a specific country, that's pretty much the only kind of food you're going to see there. So if you go to Greece, take for instance, that all you're going to see is Greek food. And if you go there, you're going to have to eat Greek food every day. For me, I personally, I really like Thai food. So everywhere that I go in the world, I look for Thai restaurants, and I've had some really great Thai food in a lot of different countries. So sometimes I will tell friends of mine, 
take for instance, I'll say, oh, I had a really great Thai meal in Greece. And they'll look at me with this very puzzled look on their face. And they'll say, Thai food? They have Thai food in Greece? And I'd say, well, yeah, they had Thai food in Greece. Why wouldn't they? And they'll come back with, well, because you're in Greece, not Thailand. But then I have to remind them that you can eat Thai food in a lot of different places in the United States, and that's not Thailand either. The fact is, Americans are not the only ones who like to eat, eat, eat other people's foods. So that's something that I think people don't realize sometimes, that we all like to eat each other's cuisines. So yes, you will see other types of food and can have other types of food in all of the different countries that you go to. Now let's talk about some assumptions that deal with restrooms and toilets. One assumption is that public restrooms are free. Most places in the United States, that is the case. But in a lot of places around the world, you have to pay to use the public restroom. It's usually a very minimal amount. It's not much at all that you'd have to pay but you do have to actually pay to use it. Another assumption with public restrooms is that you're going to have toilet paper. In a lot of places around the world, when you go into a public restroom, there won't be any toilet paper. It's actually quite common to see that situation. Sometimes if you're paying for going into a public restroom, they will ask you if you need some toilet paper and provide some. That doesn't happen very often though, so most of the time, if you're going to go into a public restroom, there's a very high chance that there's not going to be any toilet paper there. So if you think that you're going to need some toilet paper while you're out and about, you might want to take a little bit along with you, just in case that situation happens. And furthermore, in a public restroom, the assumption is that there's going to be some soap there to wash your hands after you're done. That's also something that a lot of times you do not see. There will not be soap there. So you want to bring a little bit along with you or maybe some hand sanitizer just in case so that you're able to at least clean your hands a little bit after you use the public restroom. Another assumption with toilets in general is that you can flush your toilet paper down the toilet. Now in the United States and other Western countries, you can do that. But in a lot of the rest of the world, you're not able to do that. The plumbing system is not designed to accommodate that. So to avoid clogging the pipes, they have a bin that sits beside the toilet and that's where you throw your used toilet paper. So if you see that beside the toilet, that's how you should be using it. And bear in mind, even some places that are developed countries, first world countries like Greece, are places where in a lot of cases you can't flush the toilet paper down the toilet. So just keep that in mind. And if you see a bin beside the toilet, that's telling you that's where you should put your used toilet paper. Now let's talk a little bit about assumptions regarding money. And one assumption is that if you have US dollars, you're going to be able to use those dollars anywhere you go in the world. They'll be accepted in any country. And that's not the case. And I guess that assumption comes from the fact that the US dollar is the world's reserve currency, but that doesn't mean it's accepted everywhere. So there are a few countries, a few places in the world where the US dollar is the accepted currency, places like Panama, Cambodia, Ecuador. So you can use the US dollar there because it's standard usage there. But most other countries, you're going to have to use their currency. So you'll have to convert your money into their money. And if you want to know a little more about using money in other countries, check out the, the link above and it'll take you a video that I did about using money and how to manage your money when you're traveling. I should also add that there are a few countries where they will accept US dollars from you as long as they're in really good condition. Argentina is a place like that. If you have a US dollar, it's got to be very crisp, clean, no wrinkles, very perfect. Then they'll take it and they'll, they'll, they will accept US dollars in that case. But if it has the slightest imperfection to it, they're not going to accept it. So it's better to just go ahead and convert your money into 
whatever the currency is of the country that you're in. Now let's talk about transportation. And the assumption there is that most of the world drives on the right-hand side of the road. For Americans and Europeans, they may have that feeling that, well, other than you know, the UK, that's probably the only place they're ever gonna go where they drive on the left-hand side. But there are actually quite a few places in the world where the people drive on the left-hand side, including places like India, and Japan, a lot of Southeast Asia like Thailand, Malaysia, and Indonesia, Singapore. So there are quite a few places that you will encounter left-hand side of the road driving. So keep that in mind, especially if you're planning to rent a car in any of these countries. So you're not surprised when you go there and realize, oh, I have to drive on the other side of the road from what I'm used to. One other assumption with transportation, especially if you're a pedestrian, is that pedestrians have the right of way. In the United States, that's the case. If you're in a crosswalk, traffic has to stop for you to go across the crosswalk. But in other parts of the world, that's not necessarily the case. And you definitely shouldn't assume that it is because it could be a very dangerous assumption. So make sure that when you cross the street, you don't assume that the trap is, is going to stop for you. So let's talk about electricity and the assumption that the electrical plugs around the world are going to be able to accept any of the devices that you're gonna plug into them. But that's not the case. There are a lot of different types of electrical outlets in the world and you need to have an adapter to make sure that you can plug your device into that outlet. So it's important to have a device like this. This is a, uh, an adapter. It's uh, where you would plug your device in on this side, and then on the other side, you're gonna have several different kinds of, of uh, configurations that would plug into whatever that particular outlet is in the wall. This is one that's good, good for Europe, this is one that would be used in uh, the UK. And this is another one. I think you can use this in Australia, a few other places as well. Most of the places around the world, you're gonna be able to use an adapter like this one and be able to plug into just about any outlet. The only place I've ever been where I had to get a special plug was South Africa. They have a, a unique kind of a plug there, so I had to actually buy a different type of a plug to plug in. Uh, to adapt so that I would be able to plug in my devices. So also on this particular device or this particular um, adapter that I have, it also has these uh, outlets on the bottom for USB. So you can plug in, I use it for my phone, plug in when I want to charge my phone. So if you're interested in this uh, adapter, I'll leave a link in the, com in the uh, description down below so you can take a look at that. Another assumption about electricity is that it's going to be reliable. When you flip the switch, it's always going to come on. And in the United States and most of the Western world, that's usually the case, unless there's a storm that knocks out the power. But in other parts of the world, there are occasions where the power may go out for a while. It may go out for an hour or something like that, and it's very common. So just keep that in mind. In certain parts of the world, it's not automatically reliable, that electricity is always going to come on when you flip the switch. So now let's talk about general terminology and differences that we may have in the way that we describe certain things. Now, I think most people are very familiar with the, the term soccer being used in the United States when the rest of the world uses the word football to describe that same sport. And you may also be familiar with some of the differences in uh, what you would call an elevator in the United States. Most of the rest of the world calls it a lift. Also an apartment. A lot of times in other parts of the world, it's called a flat. So there are differences in the way that we describe different things. And some of them are very important to know about. One thing that I found in most parts of the world is what we call the first floor of a building. So in the United States, the first floor is the ground floor. And then the next floor above that is the second floor. But in a lot of the rest of the world, you have first the ground floor 
And then this, the floor that's above that is called the first floor. So you need to know that if someone is going to tell you for your hotel or your apartment that, oh, your apartment is on the first floor. And you may assume, oh, that means I can go right into it. I don't have to go up any stairs to get to it. But that's not true. If it's on the first floor, it's likely going to be on the floor above that, what we would call the second floor in the United States. So it's an important difference to know about. I mentioned earlier about several assumptions re with respect to restrooms. And that term restroom is one that you don't normally hear in other parts of the world outside the United States. Most of the rest of the world is either going to call it a toilet or you're going to see signs for WC, which stands for water closet. And that's how you'll know where the restroom is located if you're in a public place. Just look for toilet or WC. Another assumption is the terminology regarding when the week begins. So in the United States, we have calendars where the week starts on the day of Sunday and it ends on Saturday. And that's what we call a week. But in a lot of the rest of the world, the week begins on Monday. So you'll see a calendar that starts on Monday and ends on Sunday. So that's an important difference. And you do see that quite often. And you need to pay attention to it, especially if you're making reservations online and you are selecting days, just making sure you're picking the right day of the week, because it can be confusing if you don't realize that the days that are showing on the screen start on Monday. Each week starts on Monday and ends on Sunday, not starting on Sunday and ending on Saturday. And it can be confusing if you're talking with other people. I had this experience. I was in Portugal and I was staying at this place and I was talking with the owner of the, of the place on a Sunday afternoon. And so he was asking me about a hike that I told him I was wanting to make. He said, are you going to be doing that hike? And I said, yeah, I'm planning to do it this week because I was going to be doing it on Tuesday. But he looked at me with this very puzzled look and I realized then what I had said because he was thinking this week would mean like right now because Sunday, this is Sunday, it's the end of the week. So if you're going to do it this week, that means you're going to do it today. And it's already in the afternoon, so I'm very confused by that. So that's when I realized, oh, I mean next week. I'm going to be doing it on Tuesday, which would be next week. And then he said, oh, okay, I understand. So it's a difference in the way that we describe what a week is and when a week starts and when a week ends. And if you think it's odd that they would say it starts on Monday and ends on Sunday, think about what we call the weekend. What is the weekend? It's Saturday and Sunday. So it quite naturally should be at the end of the week. So in reality, I think the way that we do it in the United States is, is a little wrong, actually. So it makes a little more sense to say that the week starts on Monday and it ends with the weekend on Saturday and Sunday. And another thing with dates is the way that you show a date uh, as far as the day, the month, and the year. So in the United States, we will put the month first, then the day, and then the year. So for instance, October 15th would be 10, 15, 2024. But in a lot of the rest of the world, it's the date and the month are switched around. So instead of saying 10, 15, 2024, you would say 15, 10, 2024. It's 15 October. 2024. So that's a difference that you need to pay attention to as well, because that can confuse you and can confuse others as well if you're not using that format for your dates. Well, I hope you learned some things in this video and that you're open to challenging your assumptions when you travel. If you enjoyed it, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Until next time, let's get out there and travel.